I use some terminology that uh, a lot of people don't like, um, or that may even sound pretentious, and I don't blame people for thinking that it is. Um, one of the more controversial terms that I'll use is the herd, which kind of has two sources in my vocabulary. One of them obviously is Nietzsche, where he posited the view that most people simply want to have their values handed to them and made for them by other people. Um, the second more interesting one is the um, the way that the ancient Greeks used it, the hoi polloi, which just means the many. Um, it's kind of the same word as the herd, where they were just seen as this mass, this thing, or the demos, or something like that, the people. Now, <clears throat> I don't necessarily use it in a pejorative sense, and in the original ancient Greek, it wasn't wasn't actually pejorative, it was just meant a group of living things. Um, it's come down to us as a pejorative um, because we purport to live in a society that's individualistic when I kind of believe it's a lot more collective than we realize. Um, but I don't mean it in a pejorative sense, I just mean it as a descriptive and as sort of a dare I say it and admit to this, a label, a way of talking about a certain tendency um, that is just on a certain level a tendency. It's not something that you can just say that the herd simply is the herd and that's all you need to know about it. It's just people can be members of the herd and still be fully individual but just on a certain level, i.e. at the epistemological level or at the moral and ethical level, they want all that stuff to be handed to them. Whereas they're perfectly capable of all kinds of initiatives um, and drive within the context of morals and rules and everything that have been provided for them. They haven't thought through their own ethics or their own um, metaphysics or their own epistemology or anything like that. They just take it from other people. That's how I um, uh, use the term, the herd. People who just look around and see what they see and that this is real. And when they turn on the television the attitudes that are put forward to them are to be agreed with or disagreed with, but it's not as though the underlying reality of it all is, is in question. Now, the question arises, if we're going to use the term like the herd, and we're trying to be as clinical as possible when describing it, or when using the term, it comes down to what value does the herd have? It's herdness. Is that a good or a bad thing? Um, I don't. I think it's a sort of a value-neutral thing. I think some people simply are not thinkers by nature, and that's just how it goes. They're doers, or they're followers, or even leaders are sometimes herd-like in that they simply take the rules of their society as a given and seek to be the ones who enforce them or administer them or this sort of thing, regulate things, moderate society. <clears throat> Anyone who sort of thinks for themselves in terms of the basic underlying reality of their own existence and existence in and of itself, I would say is something somewhat non-herd-like, even if you live as a member of the herd, more or less as I do. I rarely rock the boat in my society. I, I, as I said, I've been involved in union politics all my career, but even that is sort of an accepted forum in which to rebel type thing. It's um, union politics is a way, it's kind of like democracy, that has brought conflict into the way the herd works. It's been regulated. Now, I mean, sort of someone who is someone who's herd-like is someone who wants to follow orders, in my opinion, who wants to be told how things are, who wants to be told what to do, who wants to be um, have everything handed to them, at least in terms of direction in life. Should we interfere with that? Like, and we being, I guess, I'm putting myself outside of the herd when I do this, and, you know, subconscious arrogance is being displayed or whatever, but when you, when you talk to an Indian, a high caste Indian, about the caste system in India, a lot of them will say, a lot of the more thoughtful among them will say, okay, we understand that the religion followed by the lower orders or the mythologies or whatever followed by the lower orders is kind of infantile and silly and it's a, you know it, in a way it kind of keeps them in darkness um, 
telling them, yes, all your problems will be solved if you bow down before this image of Krishna or whatever. Um, but these lower class people, these lower caste people, they need this. They need this mythology to make sense of their lives. They're lost without it. Um, one of the most um, common things you hear um, in terms of Hindu societal thinking is don't disturb the faith of the simple. Um, that's an interesting view of the herd, isn't it? I can see how if a, if a faith system enslaves the lower orders, then obviously it's to the master's interest. It's in the master's interests to um, not disturb the faith of the simple. But there's another way of looking at it. Is it in, is it, is it in the interests of the simple to have their faith disturbed? Are they going to be better off if they leave the cave? Using Plato's, meta, uh, um, Plato's um, allegory of the cave. Is everybody benefited? Is, does everyone benefit by enlightenment? Does everyone benefit by having the blinkers removed from their eyes? Um, I go back to Lovecraft when I think of that. and He often talks about people who had blinkers on that actually were they were better off to be wearing because the truth itself was hor was horrific. Now I don't believe that the truth itself is horrific, but if you've if you've come to rely upon your blinkers, if you've come to rely upon your illusions, if you've come to rely upon your faith, your gods, your mythologies, or whatever, um, your entire life, are you really doing somebody a favor by disabusing them of all that? Let's you know if we want to call it bullshit. Are we really helping that person by saying, you understand that you're living in darkness here? Um, that you're, you know, you're not thinking your way out of a fundamentally insane or illogical situation. How are they going to benefit from this? Um, is um, forcing people to confront their own view of things beneficial in all cases. I know that what I'm saying is it can be construed as a terribly elitist thing, but I'm just talking about from their own first person perspective, the the quality of their own existence. Not the overall good of society or them in the abstract, but a real solid human being in front of you who believes all kinds of things. And are you doing them a favor by demolishing all that? Now, I get accused of being a demolisher, of being a person who just smashes things and doesn't really put anything in its place. I, well, I'm doing, I, I'm, I'm maybe conducting myself like this, but I'm doing so in a forum that is the exchange of ideas. Does it really do me any good to sneak up on people in a coffee shop when they're talking about something and just challenging every last supposition that takes place, random strangers? Um, just, you know, being the stereotypically negative um, caricature of the sophist. Does that really benefit people? I'm not sure that it does. Um, but isn't that sort of a, a counter, or I would say almost a blasphemy against our ideas of progress, that we're progressing from darkness into light? Are we progressing from darkness into light? Is the truth automatically light to everybody? Or are some people simply better off with their illusions?